There we go. <laughs> this is June 25th of 2015. It is a little after 9 a.m. in the morning. This is Franklin Rungi, the interviewer. The interviewee is James Park Jr. of Lexington, Kentucky, and he graduated from the College of Law in 1958. As I said, let's just hear a little bit about sort of your childhood and sort of right. kind of your family situation kind of growing up. I uh, was born in Lexington on April the 16th. 1933 on McDowell Road, uh, a, just a couple of blocks from Henry Clay's home, and uh, I haven't gotten far physically in life. I now live behind that Henry Clay's home at the corner of Woods Point and Ashwood. Uh, when I was uh, about five years old, my uh, the family moved to the country out Tate's Creek Pike. Uh, what was in the country then, now it's in the city. Uh, and so I grew up basically on a farm. Uh, I went to the university school that was a part of the Department of Education of the University of Kentucky. Uh, starting in kindergarten, went all the way through, and graduated from high school in 1951. Did you have siblings? I had one older sister who's still living. She's about six and a half years older than I, and uh, she went to the same the university school. She did her undergraduate work at the University of Kentucky also. Uh, that was all the siblings uh, that I had. Uh, my father was a lawyer. He was, um, from as long as I can remember, Commonwealth's attorney here in Fayette County. Uh, that was at a time when uh, the city or in the county were was small enough that it was a part-time job and uh, he, he was it was for six year terms and he was elected four times which was a little unusual because it carried all the way through the depression he was Republican uh, and he was active in Republican politics my mother was a graduate of the university also, very proud of the fact that she was inducted in the first class of Phi Beta Kappa at the university. Uh, so we had this university background. Uh, why did I, well, after I got out of school, I had a family friend who was a couple years older than I who was going to Princeton. and. Uh, I asked him, I said, tell me about the school. He said, it's a good school. I think you would enjoy it. It would be good for you. So I applied and got in. I, it would have been a lot harder today. <laughs> and so I graduated up there, took history. It was my major, main, mainly American history, but uh, history generally. And uh, it's always been sort of a love that I've had. Uh, I picked up from my father who loved history, and uh, uh, so, so that fit right in. And uh, uh, I did well enough there, came back here to go to law school. Now, why did I go to law school? Uh, I never felt any pressure from my father to become a lawyer. but. He was uh, unusual in that he was a great trial lawyer, uh, being a prosecutor. Uh, he was not one that believed in a lot of emotion. He, he had a voice that could carry anywhere in the courtroom without loudspeakers and the like. Uh, but it, it was uh, always modulated. He was always polite. He'd cut a witness up politely. 
I mean, he was really a good trial lawyer, but he was a book lawyer too. Uh, he loved legal problems, and he was sort of a lawyer's lawyer. There were lawyers all over the state that would come to him because they had a unique problem, ask him to join them, or <laughs> pump him for information. <laughs> and if my father had something interesting, he'd just talk about it. And uh, I can remember that he uh, told about one case he was involved in, involving a, a train that had started in Ohio, lost its brakes as it was going across the river and jumped the tracks in Kentucky. And they had a an agreement between the railroads that whoever's tracks, or wherever the accident occurred, that was responsible. Didn't matter who owned the locomotive or the like. And so the brakes failed in Ohio. It ran out of control on the <laughs> the bridge yeah. that was owned by a third railroad, and then jumped a track to, in Kentucky on the third railroad. And he he was fascinated by that. Yeah, had a great time, and he would talk about cases like that. I mean, that stuck in my mind. I have no idea how many years ago that was, and so I decided that I would like law. It involved history, and uh, so after I graduated from Princeton, I. I thought I wanted to practice, although I didn't know. And I thought, well, I better come back to Kentucky if I'm going to practice in Kentucky. Now, do you have a memory of childhood going to court with your father and watching him try cases? On occasion, On yeah. Occasion? Do On you, occasion, yes. What were the kind of, do, what's your sort of earliest memories that were are kind of fully formed about those trials? I, I can't recall. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. I can't recall a specific trial, but I can remember uh, going and watching him in some criminal prosecution. And I don't remember, I just, I mean, it was, I, I remember going to court. I didn't do it as a habit. The only other time I can remember specifically going to court was during the trial of Ed Pritchard. Going to federal court and watching part of that session. And uh, what was that trial about? Well, Ed Pritchard had been uh, a wonder boy of the New Deal in Washington and had come back to Kentucky. He graduated from Princeton and then Harvard Law and he was Frank Frankfurter's law clerk and he was on the inner sanctum of the White House. And he came back to Kentucky and he was going to be governor. And he was unquestionably a brilliant person. But at that point in time, he, he traveled unencumbered by a whole lot of ethics, and so he and some, at least one other person stuffed some ballots in Bourbon County. And some Republican precinct worker, her ballots shaken in the box when they were getting ready to open and he sat on the box and called the FBI, and so they had the evidence, and uh, the trial was uh, notorious, uh, in part because uh, Pritchard had gone to the circuit judge over in Bourbon County that was the father of a, one of his friends and uh, to ask for advice what he ought to do. Well, that was a mistake, because he talked too much to the judge, and one of the legal issues was that attorney-client privilege, and the 
ruling was no, he was, could not act as a an attorney in a case that he was acting as a friend and there was no privilege. And that went all the way to the Supreme Court and got affirmed because they couldn't get a majority. A, a, a quorum, I think, but I've forgotten that. Pritchard came back later on and uh, basically got hold of himself and the Pritchard Committee. Committee, yeah. That's it, Pritchard. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, so his, the last years of his life were unlike his first years. Yeah. Anyway, do you want to know what I, trials I saw? Yeah. That fascinated yeah. me because of the, the issues that were involved and the uh, uh, the personalities that were involved, uh, and it was in federal court because it was a federal uh, election. So then, after seeing some of these early cases, you you knew you wanted to practice in Kentucky. Yeah, I, I thought so. Now, I, I'll say it wasn't just seeing it, but it was hearing legal issues discussed uh, that weren't necessarily uh, 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 jury trials. And my father, for some reason, did not drive. And once I got a driver's license, I used to drive him all over the state. And so. Uh, a lot of that was political. Other parts of it was he'd be going up arguing motion or one thing or another. Uh, and I'd listen to him talk about the cases and that made it interesting. So I decided that if I want to practice law, I better come here. And after I graduated in 1958, uh, I wasn't sure whether I wanted practice or whether I wanted to teach and so I, I did a year and a half up at Yale and got a master's and I thought there was more politics there than there was in a courthouse and came back to practice law. So when in after you graduated from Princeton that summer did you come back here and live in Kentucky? Yeah, yeah. All right. So you lived out on the farm that where that's you're, right. Now, so your father was an attorney. Was he just a, also a gentleman farmer, or did you all have actual like a working farm? Well, he was a gentleman farmer, yeah. uh, in the sense that uh, he didn't do any farming. But it was yeah. an act. It was a real farm, and particularly during World War Two, you know, you were, patriotic duty was have gardens and chickens and hogs and one thing or another so we did and uh, so I grew up I uh, knowing a little bit about farming but I, I suppose I was like my father my father grew up on a farm at five there were five brothers and uh, he said that he knew he wanted to make his living with his head and not his back <laughs> That's fair. But yeah. he loved the country. So, so that summer you were there, after you graduated from college, you were there at home for the summer. And did, did you enroll in law school at, here at the University of Kentucky? Correct. That fall then? Yeah, yeah. Right. I graduated in 55 from Princeton and entered that fall, entered the law school class. Class in fall of 1955. What was, did you... I'm trying to just imagine what the admissions process was and how you managed it. Did you just come and talk to the, was it Dean Starr Star at the time? Mm, uh, it was, but yeah. my, my only recollection of the procedure was in the admissions office where they didn't understand the grading system at Princeton, which was not an A, B, C, D, E. It was a numerical system. And so they were trying to equate it to the ABC and say that if I had a, a well, they, there were more numbers than there were letters. And so you couldn't convert them as such. And, and, and it, I, 
as I recall, the admissions officer for the law school, whoever that was, I think it was up in the uh, administration building. Uh, <laughs> I never did get it through that person's head. And uh, she was questioning how good my grades were, even though I graduated magna cum laude. <laughs> so be that as it may. Uh, Star was probably dean only one semester. He was in and out. He was dean and then this was before I got here. And then he went to serve, maybe he was Air, he was Air Force Secretary at one point in time, I think. And then W.L. Matthews substituted for him. And then when he came back, and I think he was dean my first semester, but I can't be positive about that. Uh, Matthews succeeded him. Matthews taught first year property. I'll never forget. <laughs> he would take out his watch, said, "I give you my watch." And then he would go from that gesture as to what it took for transfer of property and for the I'll never. I'll give you my watch. He was faculty athletics representative before Bob, mm -hmm. and a real straight arrow. Bob will tell you that, Bob Lawson. Yeah. And uh, so he was dean and taught property, I think, for the whole time. And what else did I take that first year? Uh, common law pleadings, which had to be the dullest subject I ever took anywhere. <laughs> and all I can say is that it enabled you to read some old cases and understand what they were talking about and also to get some concept of what were the basic causes of action of common law things. And that was uh, taught by McEwen, and I can't think of his first initials, I'm confusing with the developer, mm -hmm. but sometime, I think it was the freshman year, McEwen was struck by lightning and killed out on the Lexington Country Club or, or some golf course, and some so when we moved up to uh, uh, out of common law pleadings to uh, the, co the code and the civil rules, that was a great step forward. Yeah, yeah Alfred McEwen, Alfred. who was out of Virginia. Yeah, he, he yeah. was a nice fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did the best he could with his subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, Roy Moreland taught uh, criminal law. And I think that would have been the first year, but he had the law of homicide. He had his own little book on homicide that you bought. Uh, contracts was Bert Ham. And uh, he, if you didn't get contracts, it wasn't because you were, uh, you weren't paying attention because he laid it out as, he used the same notes year after year, and he laid it out as clear as could be. Uh, and the people used to, the people took good notes that were called hammograms. Yeah. Have you heard of them? Yes, I've heard of the oh, hammogram. They well, passed on a, from year to year. Oh, okay. Then Paul Oberst was torch, and he was a brilliant fella and, and a, a great individual. I ran into uh, 
classmate of mine from Princeton who was blind at Princeton, and was from Ashland of all places, and he ended up um, going to Washington. And he became a lawyer, and I was talking to him at a reunion, a 60th reunion, and uh, Oral Miller was his name. And uh, he said, did you go to law school in Kentucky? I said, I did. I said, you, he said, did you know Paul Oberst? I said, yes, I did. Well, he was visiting professor at the University of Chicago Law School where I went. And he was a great influence on me and the work, you know, with me because that's hard being a, uh, I remember Miller used to take notes and pray for uh, back in that day and age, that was that was the only thing he could do. You punch little holes, and uh, he remembered Oberst. But that was typical of Oberst. He helped this blind law student. He he worked with uh, uh, a law student who was denied admission to the university, and he said he had to go drive over to Frankfurt, to Kentucky State, to teach this fellow in law. And that was before, finally, they, the federal court threw out that ban. This was before Brown against Board of Education. Uh, then I was trying to think who else was doing that. Uh, You know, Do uh, Dorothy Salmon taught legal bibliography, and Fred Whiteside taught uh, uh, domestic relations and uh, legal method was Mr. Starr and Mr. Matthews. I, I still don't have much memory about uh, Elvis Starr. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know when Richard Gillum came in. Uh, let's see. Gillum is must have been fifty eight or fifty nine. Yeah. And Richard Gillum. That's right. Uh, I hate to say this, but I'm sure he's gone. He was a, a likable, nice fellow. But it, it, he was known as Liquor Dick, <laughs> and uh, occasionally he had his problems on that. And now I there is a story about how he would cure his hangovers <laughs> about being put in the bathtub. Did you hear that? No, I, if I did, I've forgotten yeah. it. Where they would, he would hook himself on a harness so he wouldn't drown, <laughs> and he would pour a hot bath. And go to sleep, and then apparently the cold, when the water temperature cooled, it would wake him wake up, him. and then he wouldn't have. He allegedly he wouldn't have a hangover and would come in and teach the Saturday classes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's true. Well, I, that's one I, of the stories I've heard. Doing, you know, he was um, he was wonderful. He had, a, he had a southern accent you could cut with a knife. And uh, it was, uh, I, I, I can remember a thing, he, ta he taught legal ethics. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one thing about Dick Gillum was that in there he, he started cross-examining class. He said, why are you want to be a lawyer? And people had all these reasons that they wanted to uh, help orphans and widows and the oppressed and the poor and justice and fairness and all that. And finally, he just said, wrong, wrong, wrong. You want to do it for the money. <laughs> and then he went on to explain, but that you have to be ethical when you do it. But that don't kid yourself. You're interested in practicing law for the money. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll never forget that. I mean, he was, you know, he was adamant that you had to learn the ethics of the of the profession and treat it as a profession, but 
I'll never forget that. <laughs> he said, don't care to yourself, you're going to do it for the money. <laughs> Now, were there other, were there faculty members who you thought took a particular interest in in the student body? You know, who had close connections with students. Uh, I'd say that um, Roy Moreland didn't have a particularly close relationship with the students, and he was awfully hard on the two women. And, our class. He was the only professor that I know of that sort of made fun of them. And they stuck it out. I don't know what uh, Jesse Doyle and Ann Bircher, I think it was, what they did afterwards or where they went, but he was the, the only one that way. Uh, the other person that came on later was Jesse Dukeman here. And he was a brilliant fella. Uh, really, I guess he's passed on, but now I don't know. He went to UCLA, but he was really smart and had written some legislation on uh, uh, perpetuities, look back law. And he had a, his own notebook, and always the rule against perpetuities. He had a cartoon that says, "Trespassers will be eaten." It was uh, enjoyed. And Trespassers just, will be what? Will, eaten. Will be eaten. <laughs> he he was. Uh, he taught future and no, he didn't teach future interest for my class. He taught future interest. He taught estate planning. And he was really good at it too. He um, he left, I guess, and Tom Lewis came in and taught future interest. Mm -hmm. He was there one year, my senior year. Yeah. So he graduated, I believe, in the class of '54. I was going to say he was right before. And then he went but into his the, notes were still floating around. Yeah. He was, or I, I think it was his. Anyway, he was smart as well. He, he at that time, I think he had the best record of anybody that can come through the. Law That's uh, I. I looked at his transcript up in the registrar's office. Yeah. And it is typed on there, highest GPA ever at the College of Law as of, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he was, he was. I don't know whether anybody ever did better. Well, yeah, so there, I think there are two now, since then there have been two people who are, who have done better, but. <laughs> I, know. I know of, that I know. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. And uh, uh, so he was senior year, I thought he taught future interests, which is, uh, I enjoyed the, the course, I, I guess I was crazy, uh, other people just thought it was awful, it was, it's difficult, future interest, and, uh, but that's that. Uh, was there a professor that sort of, kind of was closest to you as a mentor, or did they I'm, all kind of take turns playing that role? Well, uh, Jesse Dukeman here had something to do with my going on up to Yale. With, with say that again? With, with my going on up to Yale for mm -hmm. graduate work. Yeah. Uh, he, had, he was in the Ivy League, he had an Ivy League education, I don't know if it was, was it Yale? That he I want to say it was, there were a lot of Yaleys around uh, at, at one point in time. And I think he was. Yale University, yeah. Yeah. That's where he got his LLB in 1951. Yeah, and uh, he had a little scar on his cheek from World War II. He was active uh, in, you know, the in, going into Germany. Uh, Oberst was, I think, he was generally pretty close to his to the people in uh, the students, the law students. I think W. L. Matthews was. Uh, 
Gillum would certainly participate after hours <laughs> with with the students. Uh, now there were um, there were law fraternities. Yeah. Yeah, there were two of them, correct? Or do or do you remember? Uh, yeah, they weren't a big thing. Were, were you a member of one or? Well, not? I was a member of one, and I'd be hard pressed to tell you which one. I, I mean, that's how important they were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, law Journal was more important. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if, if you were to get on that rather than, I mean, uh, the fraternities would have a party or something like that uh, a couple of times a year or something, but uh, th they weren't big, they weren't s social things as I recall at all. And certainly they weren't academic, as I recall. Uh, the the Law Journal, there was competition to get on that. I forget how you got on it and to write it and that sort of thing. But uh, that was considered uh, the most important thing you could do at the law school outside of the classroom. Uh, they, I don't even remember, yeah, there were some, mock, we had mock trials uh, in the procedure, and uh, I can remember some of that, but uh, there wasn't, as I recall, a program to get people as interns in the summer, it was usually if uh, somebody would go back, they'd know a lawyer in their community and they'd say, can I, can I work around your office? And of course it was all free. And that's what I did, was go down to my father's office and work there and do research. And he was still county attorney at that time? No, he had, uh, he was county attorney for two years. Then he was Commonwealth. Com attorney. Yeah, I'm sorry, Commonwealth. Commonwealth attorney for 24, and that he gave that up in 52. So he, and actually he was getting, he was still active while I was in law school, but he his health began to catch up with him afterwards, but uh, there were ten people in the office and that was just considered a huge law firm in Lexington. <laughs> and it was, it was a different world then. Uh, well, it was the same when here in law school that you had to make a carbon copy of something I mean, the only way you could do it was with, you know, flimsies and carbons. And you had to do it right the first time. You usually wrote something out. I couldn't type. Most lawyers didn't type. They would write something out on a yellow pad. And uh, I can remember the first copy machine. And it was a Kodak wet copier and being the youngest person in, around the office I was the only one that really knew how to make copies <laughs> but you could you could copy a case and that was remarkable mm -hmm. but so during the summers that's what you would do is go down there and what was the name of the front Stahl Keenan and Park uh -huh. oh. my father Judge Stahl it had been originally Stahl, Muir, Townsend, and Park, and Keenan, our old dear, and they got merged. So that's my. Uh, Those were your summers then? The, they they were the summers, yeah. And so you worked for free down there, or did they pay you a little bit? Or? Uh huh. You worked for free. You might get mileage. You like mileage. But you, so did you work, now a lot of people worked during law school to sort of 
Yeah. yeah. So did you work during law school any job, no. or was you, did you, was no. you able to rely on family, or? Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, I did not have to work during law school. Uh, I know one person that had worked earlier class, he had worked at one of the funeral homes on the night desk and he had plenty of time to study. He was a good student. <laughs> so, uh, there are definitely some funny stories of the different jobs people had during law school. Yeah. One person drove school buses in the morning and then got the, you know, like, you name it, people just. Some of them were reporters. Kent uh, Hollingsworth was a reporter. Kent Hollingsworth, yeah. And a good one. Uh, he ended up in the equine area. Uh, mm -hmm. Right offhand, I don't come up with any in my class any jobs that were mm -hmm. of interest. Of what would you all do between class breaks? Would you all, all study, or did what were some of the? Was it all studying during between class breaks, or what, did you all have like social certain games or? Uh, well, the worst thing that happened is you know Lafferty Hall. Yeah. Uh, the walk in front of it goes down to the library, and so there's a lot of traffic. And the law students tended to congregate on the front porch between classes. And the most benign thing they did was pitch pennies for cracks in the concrete. Or joints in the concrete, but uh, occasionally they would comment on the pulchritude of some of the coeds that went by, particularly some of the veterans <laughs> that were around. Uh, that was probably the biggest uh, activity between classes mm -hmm. that I know of. But I love, you know, pitching pennies. So, uh, Were you good at it? No, not particularly. No. Now, we had one member of my class. I don't know what class he here's, uh Here's some of the students. Here's a list of some of the students during, as I mentioned, this is your graduating class and well, the year below you. Uh, so. The one I'm trying to think of is uh, John Wild Brown, Jr. And I don't know when he graduated. It could have been 60 or 61. Because he, it, it could have been. The reason I'm saying that is that there was a lounge. There was a student lounge in the law school. And John Y was the biggest Encyclopedia Britannica salesman in Kentucky. Did you ever hear that story? Well, I knew he sold them, and he made a lot of money doing it. Oh, he made, right. And he was making so much money that he was, law school was weighing very lightly on his shoulders, so to speak. And I can remember some people thinking that, you know, here he is, his father's a very prominent lawyer, and he's just, you know, floating through. And, I mean, he was busy with his salesmanship. And, of course, he could ended up, uh, we thought he was wasting his time. He could, he could bought the whole class when he got out and got into fried chicken. Now that's one person that I remember what he was doing. I'd forgotten about that. But no, he was a leading salesman of the day. <laughs> so there was there was that. So there was uh, as far as there was a student lounge for you all. Yeah, yeah. And did you and uh, did most people hang out there? Did most people hang out in the library? I'd say a little bit of both. I mean, it depended if, if you had, a, a, well, depend on the weather, depended on a number of things. If you were not going, if the weather wasn't good, you weren't going in and out of the law school. 
uh, because it wasn't close to the student union or where you could go over across um, Limestone there up at Prawl Street. Uh, there were some places you could grab a sandwich, but uh, some people would bring their lunch. Uh, some people had cars, some of them didn't. Did you live near campus? I lived back out in the country. Oh, so did you stay at your fam folks' home when you went to school? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know whether you had a place in town that you could kind of know. So you stayed at home during law school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did most of your friends, I assume most of your friends then have, a did they have apartments too, or did people kind of? Uh, some of them were married. Mm -hmm. uh, they were older in some ways because they, some of them had, well, they, they were married, they had families. And so they had separate apartments. And some of them were from out of town. And uh, uh, so, but there were those who were from Lexington area, and I think they may have continued to live with family. Did you commute in by car then? Did you drive yeah, in? Yeah, it, it was only uh, back then. Yeah. You could lo zip down Tate's Creek, I'm sure. Two, two lane road, we, we, lived, we, ca we called it four miles in the country. So it was a little more than four miles from Cooper Drive, mm -hmm. which was in existence, then Montclair. And that was the end of town, mm -hmm. basically. And uh, uh, you could, uh, it didn't take long to get in town. And I can't remember about parking, but parking wasn't the problem that it is it's today, yeah. where it ranks right up there with faculty and students. <laughs> and do you remember any sort of speakers or guests that visited the College of Law that left an impression? Or? No. I, 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 I mean, if I thought about it, I might. Uh, it was pretty straightforward. You had classes and you attended classes and you, uh, you, you the, the only sort of thing would be in procedure where you had mock trials and that sort of thing. But uh, no, basically it was sort of cut and dried in the sense that you were uh, taking academic courses and the, the, I don't remember lectures. Mm -hmm. I think there was, there probably was one, but I can't remember anything specific about it. Mm -hmm. Only event I remember, I don't know who put it on, it was the libel show. Which still goes on today. Does it? But yeah, the libel stuff. <laughs> oh, it was awful. <laughs> still goes on today. So they they use it to raise money for uh, for students that do public interest work. Yeah. So they well, nowadays, so, you know, they have like an auction, and the the faculty members now donate things. Like we'll have a dinner at a faculty member's home, and students bid on it, and then the money will go to help students. Okay. Yeah. I, well, it wasn't the, yeah, that, that was uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's still jokes and, you yeah, know, they yeah. make fun of stuff. And so, uh, but I, I was thinking about it. Uh, actually, I, in my opinion, you, you, you came out of the law school with a pretty good legal education. I got to see it. Uh, it in some ways with Yale for was there for a year and I, I, I stayed on a little bit doing some research for a professor. What was your master's at Yale? What was the Law. Law? Oh, okay. Master of Laws. And I, I, I sort of cherry-picked some things. What would, that, be, would that be an LLM? That you LLM. Did? So you did the LLB and then the LLM. That's right. I never switched my LLB uh, to a JD. Uh, to yeah. JD because it didn't make sense to, yeah. <laughs> for me. Yeah. And uh, so I, 
I picked out courses up there. I picked them out usually by the reputation of the professor, who was the best professor. And uh, generally, that meant I got some pretty good courses up there. What were, as far as during your time at the College of Law, were there any sort of national or local events that sort of became a focus that you remember the student body talking a lot about, or kind of what was happening sort of in the country at that time that sort of either influenced you or was something that was talked about by the students? Oh, uh, probably the implementation of uh, Brown against Board of Education, but I don't remember that in the sense of so much of it being a law school issue, although obviously we would have looked at that, mm -hmm. but it was uh, what was going on and uh, in the state, which at that point in time, compared to other states that had segregated school systems, Kentucky did pretty good. Uh, the first place there was trouble was in Clinton, Tennessee, right outside of Oak Ridge. And they had sort of a riot down there, and I forget what happened. And then about a week later, down in Union County, Sturgis, I want to say, uh, they had a disruption of trying to desegregate it. And Happy Chandler was governor then, second time. And the, the next morning the people woke up with tanks from the National Guard state on their streets. And he, he said, we're not going to have any disorder and flouting of the law in Kentucky. And that was the end of it. Now, they later had some in Louisville, but that, that had more to do with the specifics of the, of the court system, and that was after law school, as I recall. Uh, because I'm thinking about the, the, the judge, I can't remember who the judge was, uh, I think it was a judge, he, he had a little yellow school bus in his office, <laughs> and he had a sense of humor. But no, uh, that was uh, uh, a, a, something that was going on, and of course we had been looking at that where the most of the cases before Brown against Board of Education were well separate but equal, but these aren't equal, and that's how they integrated the graduate school at the university and that sort of thing, and uh, so that was the I suppose was the biggest issue hanging around that everybody would be talking about. It wouldn't be limited to the law school, mm -hmm. but uh, that was the biggest issue at that point in time. Mm -hmm. hmm. What were some of your, as far as your classmates are concerned, some of your, and here for the people that graduated with you, who were some of your best friends, do you remember, oh, and spending time with? Well, Les Mars was at that time a good friend. Yeah. And uh, I practiced law with him later on. Les Morris? Was yes, Leslie Morris. Leslie Morris. Yeah, he, he died in the Com Air crash. Oh, yeah. Uh, Joe Johnson, uh, who was a, was a lively, smart fellow, but I mean, he was, uh, he'd go off on a tangent. He had funny sense of humor, and we studied together a lot of times. Uh, 
they were good friends. Uh, it was small enough class that you didn't have exclusive ones. Like Joe Helm uh, was a friend of mine. He'd gone to Princeton a year ahead of me, and I knew him. Uh, Paul Sad was another guy who uh, was was a friend. Uh, Charlie Palmer. Uh, well, uh, the the thing is, if you look at these. The class, it's small enough that you can't you knew say everybody. Yeah. Uh, that they weren't friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you knew everybody in your class. Mm -hmm. So that's the best way I can say. Now, the reason I mentioned Les Morris at that time, because he had been in my high school class at University High School. And, you know, you know so. Mm -hmm. We had known each other for a long time. Yeah. Did he go to school here at UK or did he go to another? He went remember? to the university here. Yeah. Undergraduate. And then, and then you all met back up again for yeah. law school. That's right. That's good. What was the, do you remember much about what the grading was like here? If you thought it was fair or if you thought certain faculty members were more fair than others or? Well, I'm sure we did, but <laughs> but practical matter, uh, that doesn't stand out. Uh, some of them were a little harder than others. Uh, it, it was some some of them were easier. Their tests were easier. Some of them were harder. And Jesse Duke Meneers had the tough tests because he had some tough subjects. Bert Ham, he taught corporations also. Mm -hmm. He he laid it out, and if you if you followed your notes and his rules, you could do his test. So, I mean, that was sort of the attitude of people. Uh, I, I don't remember Beyond that, it wasn't that Bert Ham's classes were, you know, gut classes, it was the expression then. Uh, but he just, his mode of teaching was, by George, you didn't have to dig it out. He fed you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do it there. Who was it? Do you remember the classmates that sort of impressed you the most? Well, one was Paul Sad. Paul Sad. Now he had a job. He. Now it's coming by. He was an announcer for WLEX TV, and he had a melodious voice. It was sort of deep and what have you. And even though he grown up in Pike County, uh, he, he <laughs> you wouldn't have known it, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so that always you know impressed when Paul would talk. He was a bright fellow too. He went with I can't name the the, the law firm. He went with a, one of the major law firms in Tampa. Uh, he. I don't know what happened. He died on some time back, early. What if, um, do you remember what graduation was like? Do you remember the, gra the graduation ceremony? I, I don't know that I went to it. <laughs> yeah. I remember I had a little over the diploma, it said honors, and I knew that my grades, the spring term was such that I should have been, I don't know how you could have calculated it, as high honors. And I had a 
And that's the only thing I remember about graduation is having an argument. They said, well, that's true, but we didn't have your grades. Well, you do now. <laughs> so I ended up, I got my d <laughs> diploma. <laughs> but Fixed again. I got my diploma with that. That was, uh, uh, that was the only thing I remember about graduation. <laughs> that's the one bit of fly in the ointment, not anything else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, it is funny. It is funny. The well, that and, stick and in your I mind. think yeah. I was the reason I was concerned about it was I was trying to get in graduate school, and I think I was going up to to interview at various law schools uh, in the east, and uh, so I wanted the mm -hmm. <laughs> the proper recognition. recognition. There was a, a reason for it. You, but I don't remember going to graduation at all. Did the class? Do you remember the class doing something together all as a group, or no? no? I, I, we may have, but you just sort of. Uh, I, I mean, we may have, but yeah. uh, uh, people were getting ready for the bar, mm -hmm. and that would be coming up. Did and you wait to take your bar? Or yeah, I took until it, after, I, I yeah. took it actually in fifty nine. Yeah. Uh, because I think I was I, I don't remember, but I think I had gone up to uh east to interview a couple of places. But I'm not I'm, not, I'm vague on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh. So then you go, you mentioned that there was a comparison between the Yale classes and the Kentucky classes. Do you remember sort of how, the, what, the, what, what the differences were like within the LLM program and the LLB at Kentucky? Well, uh, I remember getting in <laughs> some classes I at, at Yale and, uh, oh, I've lost his name. He'd been dean up there, and he was teaching a course, and I wanted to take it just because, not that I was ever going to use it, but I wanted to take course under him. Mm -hmm. And he'd get his students in there, and he would start on them about uh, what this meant in this opinion. And they were, I didn't have any idea what replevin was or assumption or what have you and how procedurally the case came up. He was just adamant that you had to, you couldn't understand the opinion without understanding the procedure. And, and I remember saying, well, <laughs> you know, I didn't volunteer every time, but if need be, I, I had the answer because I had maybe <laughs> McEwen's damn common law plea. I had some concept of, of the thing, and it, that was one thing I learned it here. The really essential of analyzing an opinion is to understand procedurally how it got where it was and what, uh, you know, because that impact, uh, you know, the deference a corp is going to give one way or the other to one party or the appellee, who was the appellee, who was the appellant, that sort of thing. And uh, some of the practical stuff at Yale, they were great on policy, as I used to say. <laughs> but sometimes they weren't, they weren't as good on the nuts and bolts as uh, some of the classes here. Now, that wasn't everybody. But I, I, as I say, there were some courses that were an awful lot of policy, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's Yale more so than Harvard at the time. Mm -hmm. And so when you came back to Kentucky, you took the bar, sort of how did you begin your sort of legal career after that? Well, I had, it was right after they adopted the Uniform Commercial Code in Kentucky. It was about, I think, the third state. 
And I had worked with one of the draftsmen up there, and so that was one of the things I did when I got back. Uh, people knew that I had some background at it, and lawyers were having to completely relearn uh, a whole bunch of commercial law. And so I got out and I spoke, and I one thing or the other. But essentially, uh, as, as a young lawyer, I was going out at a rate of ten dollars an hour investigating truck accidents. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, uh, that was, uh, I mean, that was one of the things you did. And, uh, but then, you know, I walk into court and judges judge say, Mr. Park, I want you to represent that fellow over there. I remember Judge Ford, federal court, he said, Mr. Park, he had a little high voice, I want you to go talk to this fellow and come back and plead him guilty. <laughs> he knew he was going to plead guilty. And I had been lawyer maybe two weeks, I went back and he was, Accused of selling tobacco off of a card, you know what I'm talking about. So a lot, his allotment. He sold tobacco. He didn't have an allotment. Allotment card. for, and he was. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he he was. Um, it was more than a technical violation. He was a pretty bad guy, but <laughs> he he wasn't dangerous if you know yeah, him. Yeah. So I went back in and he said I'm guilty and whatever so I went back in and the judge took him through took his plea finally he looked over at me and said Mr. Park this is the time you ask for probation. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved for probation you are granted. <laughs> so I mean you would be thrown into something. I, I was thrown in early on into representing, you know, there was no legal defender. Right. You yeah, walked the, 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 you were around, the judge would pick 60s. you out and yeah. say, you're going to represent this fella. And uh, I and another younger lawyer, but he it was more experienced, and I were appointed to uh, on a capital case early on, and that was an interesting episode. Mm -hmm. Were you part of your father's firm when you? I, you I was associate there. Associate yeah. there? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Took a pay cut from what I'd been paid as a research assistant at Yale. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So could you talk just a little bit about what it means for you to have kind of to have gotten your law degree from this institution? Well, it, if one of the things uh, I, I thought it gave you a good basic uh, legal education, and I thought on top of that I'd gotten my money's worth, so to speak, out of the year at Yale. Uh, it gave me some insight into some things that I would not have gotten here. Uh, with the small faculty, for example, I, I did corporate income tax up at, the, up at uh, Yale because the guy was supposed to be good, he'd written the book on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, uh, it Initially, there were no specialties. Uh, there were some people who made a special, well, the only real specialty was patent law, patent and copyright law. Uh, to some degree, labor law was becoming a specialty in Kentucky. But other than that, basically, you anything walked in the door you respect you were supposed to handle it and uh, uh, so I, I went to court on some things 
um, did a lot of what I call research and brief writing, memos, uh, pleadings, and that sort of thing, but it, it was a cross thing. Was like, I, and initially I developed some expertise in the tax area. Uh, and uh, wills, trusts, corporate. That was, but that was only partial. That was only partial. You, you had to, everything slopped over into something else, contract law, tort law, uh, and, and the like. Uh, it was it was interesting. I had the advantage of practicing with some pretty good lawyers, and you get an education that way. Now, at that time, were well, most of the lawyers from had were they graduates of this school, or were they from all over? Do you remember? Have a sense? If you can't remember, that's fine too. But. I am trying to think. Uh. I don't know of anybody that wasn't a Kentucky law graduate that was in that firm. Mm -hmm. There may have been, but right off the bat, no, I can't recall anybody who who uh, wasn't a Kentucky law graduate. Yeah. What do you, um, if you have any sort of comments about? what this college sort of means for this community in the state. You mean the law school? Yeah. Well, in my opinion, it is now and always has been the leading law school in the state. That doesn't mean there can't be some good lawyers come out of Northern Kentucky or Louisville, but that this was all things considered, this was a place, you, uh, you know, all through the years that you wanted to get into the University of Kentucky Law uh, College of Law because it was the best law school in the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it has, in my opinion, uh, produced some good lawyers, good judges, that sort of thing. Do you um, have any sort of, I would be interested now, I feel like we've covered a lot of good ground. If you wanted to mention a few things, you talked about your father attending law school and graduating here in 1920. If you want to kind of touch on any sort of stories he told you about law school. Oh, uh, no, but it was, it was, uh, Basically, he graduated in 20, so he he got out of the university undergraduate in 1950. And then he would have, I'm not sure when he entered law school, uh, 1920, 18. It would have been, a, I think, in 1917. Uh, and of course, World War One came up. He was on his own at that point in time, and he was, you know, people. What is what's your summer job? Well, <laughs> it's pitching ba <laughs> baseball, and he, uh, if he said he never had the uh, speed to overpower batters after his football injury. So he, in those days, it was before the Kurt Flood case, you signed a contract, that contract stayed with you the rest of your baseball career. It didn't matter where he was playing, he was gonna get the same amount of money. And uh, so he, he played for Drumright, Oklahoma. <laughs> which was a little oil boom town. And he, he got the same as he, when he was in the majors, which wasn't bad pay, but it wasn't like anything like that. But he, he, 
he uh, with World War One, and this is what I've not done is tried to figure out how his law school fit in with the fact that he had to go to uh, aviation school at Ohio State and from there went down to advanced school at San Antonio and then they sent him up to Norfolk or Hampton Roads Coast in the Coast Artillery. Well, what what they had there was a balloon core, mm -hmm. and I guess because he was a math major and he was big, he'd been too big for an airplane, and he didn't drive a car. I think, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how he, when the war was over, I think he immediately uh, got back in law school. It looks like it would have been before the war, really, before America entered the war. Because America entered in... 19, 17. Oh, April. Was, okay. April so of April of 17. 17. He would have probably... So that's about when he's entering. Uh, yeah, and, and that's what's confusing. And I've looked yeah, for his, trans, his transcript. But it was... Uh, he was also... Did you say you had looked for or, or here mm -hmm. at times? He was so he had while he was going to law school, and this is what I, I don't have the chronology. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point in time, he was coach at Transylvania and athletics director there, which, you know, <laughs> whatever, but he was also. Uh, assistant football coach and ended up coaching one year basketball at Kentucky. And I think a part of that was while he was going through law school. Mm -hmm. And they must have done something about letting the veterans uh, accelerate or the like. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, he didn't talk about that, it was more about what he was doing Mm -hmm. uh, outside of it, and the, the stories he told me is, you know, when I was a boy about his adventures in Drumlight mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, Oklahoma City and Omaha and all that sort of thing. But I, I, I can't recall. He had some of his law books still. Uh, I guess he kept them uh, because. He he used the criminal. He was in the criminal, you know, prosecutor, mm -hmm. and he was he was he was a good book lawyer. He liked them. Uh, Do you still well, have any of your father's library, or is that all just gone? Uh, no, they all got put in sort of the firm law library. Oh, okay. I had one book of his, and it it. it disappeared somewhere along the line. I no. was just curious if he still had those. Those would have been neat to see. Yeah, I, it was a, a, a handbook on criminal law. I remember that. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> it was more he would talk about people he had known in law school. And, uh, but I can't recall he was talking about the particular professors. He did, but it's, it's not something that's stuck in my mind. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned Red Wine out there, is, uh, who graduated with your father. Do you remember any story? None that I won't yeah. tell. All right, that's, <laughs> that's totally fair, too. Yeah. There were some, <laughs> I think his name was Marcus, but some other people pronounced it differently. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Is it I, Ed Dabney was, uh, uh, I'd forgotten that he had the legal background, but he was uh, head of security trust company mm -hmm. that merged with the First National Bank, and that became First Security, which was later acquired by Bank One and is now J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, 
That was his background. He was a very prominent man around Lexington. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah, that's how. Wow. Is there anything else that you'd like to sort of add or mention before, as we kind of come to a close? Uh, I, I was trying to think back to, uh, the only other thing I would add is that Fred Whiteside's wife, I've lost her first name, but he always referred to her as Miss Lizenby. He married sort of late in life, Fred mm -hmm. was uh, just a delightful person, but in a way sort of a cartoon uh, character in the sense that the absent-minded professor, uh, that's a, not the label I want to put on. And uh, that was, uh, she was very active in academic, one thing or another. Paul Olberth's wife, Libet, she was a lawyer. She'd gone to University of Michigan, as I recall. Mm -hmm. She was very active. She had a you know, good reputation in, uh, around the law school. Dick Gillum wasn't married, Jesse Duke Manier wasn't married. Uh, Tom Lewis was married, but he had a family, and we, we just didn't see him, and I only saw him that one year. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes the faculty wives, for example, I remember going with Fred and some others to some sort of conference of law students somewhere in the Carolinas, and uh, his wife went along. Mm -hmm. She was a uh, very interested in law school things. She was a good person. And I'm, I'm mad at myself that I can't think of her name. And and the same for a little bit of uh, Obers. Uh, I don't ever recall W.L. Matthews' family. Mm -hmm. So th that's that's all I could add that I had. Fred's to wife and Paul's wife had, did things to sort of be active and p take part in the community. Yeah, and and in university affairs and uh, community affairs, you knew who they were. They were active. Yeah. Uh, That's nice. In things. Yeah. Uh, Paul Oberst was an interesting, he, he was, uh, uh, there were some smart people on that faculty. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether you've, uh, how much you've been able to gather on that, but there were some smart people that were on that faculty. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one of the reasons. That's the one thing that, yeah. If you want stories, I don't know whether anybody ever said this, but Roy Moreland was rotund, and as I recall, <laughs> he didn't wear an undershirt, <laughs> and all the wives would sit around, and the first one that spotted <laughs> his navel poking through the <laughs> gap in his shirt would cry, "I spy." <laughs> He never knew what that was about, <laughs> but everybody in the class knew it. It was terrible. We shouldn't have done that. But that is funny. Anyway, yeah. I bet you haven't heard that story before. Nope, I haven't heard that. <laughs> I've heard some other ones about him. There was one where a, a student fell asleep in Roy Moreland's class, and Roy started to yell at the student next to him to say, "Wake up, Mr. Johnson, or whatever his name was. Yeah. Wake him up." And the student said, well, you put him to sleep, you could <laughs> Oh, yeah. There were, oh, there were people who would... Give it, give it back. Give, give yeah. it back to him. And sometimes yeah. he would say something in class, somebody would have a case that disagreed, and they'd post it. <laughs> I mean, you know, they would give him... Yeah, he, <laughs> served, in, he served in World War I. Did he? Yeah, he served in World War I. He was a 
maybe he was a ranking officer and he served on now there is a photograph of him. he served in France because he ended up having a correspondence for many years with some man he met in France that's interesting and they still have the we have the letters that's interesting yeah you know, we have the and we have photographs from his time in France well I never had any problem yeah. with Roy Moore well, some people uh, he, yeah, some of them some people suffered under yes there was one person who mentioned that you know he that many students did not think that his grades were anonymous that uh, they thought that he knew that he would look at the numbers yeah when he graded there were some you know how many who knows whether I, that's true or not but I, I, that sort of rings a bell but I, <laughs> I, not, it doesn't stand out yeah. but I know that he would have it uh, in for some some students. Yeah, you know, which is unfortunate. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he is uh, described definitely as interest as an interesting character. Yeah. Well, he was. He was. Yeah. And he wrote the book on homicide. And, That's right. And, and he had that. Yeah, it was it was a red cover, I think. I think it was a it was his little homicide book. I but, thought it was black. Maybe it was. I'd have, to, I'd have to go look at that again and see if I can. I, I don't remember. I just, you know, for sure. I put up my image is yeah, yeah. black. little thin book, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah W.L. Matthews was a smart fellow. Mm -hmm. He was a good guy. He was straight as an arrow. Uh, you would never say anything about him or Oberst or or Bert Ham. Yeah. He was as kind as he was the opposite pole from Roy Moore. Yeah, how funny! That's yeah. something. Well, well, do you know what? If I was going to say before you leave, if you have a minute, and I don't know if it's going to be up there, but we can go up to the registrar's office and see if we can pull your father's transcript. I don't know if it'll be there, but we can at least try. Well, I, I got it. Oh, okay, so you've seen it. I I've didn't know seen, seen it. it. Yeah. If I if I cannot find it, but 